Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, listeners. I so appreciate you giving me some of your time. I know today is totally going to be worth the time investment. With me today is Sarah Hoyt. She is the Chief Social Impact Officer with a company called BioV, and they are investigating a molecule, the numbers and the letters I'll let her tell you about, that target inflammation in the brain, and hopefully their research and clinical trials will help us find a treatment or a cure for many neurodegenerative diseases. Whew, did I get that all right, Sarah? <laughs> you did, and thank you so much for your focus on this topic. It's an important one. Well, my mom had Alzheimer's disease for 20 years, as my listeners know. My maternal grandmother had vascular dementia, and my maternal great-grandmother had whatever form of dementia. She died before I was born, so I'm not sure they even... They even had distinguishing types at that point. It was back in the late 60s. So it's obviously a, it's a concern for our family history, but it's also, since my mom is now gone, I like to hear about what's going on besides the continued chasing of amyloid plaques, because while we do now have some treatments, I guess the new one, and I'm probably going to pronounce it wrong, denanumab coming out. It's supposed to be even better than Lakembi. <sighs> I've talked to a couple other people about possible treatments that are in the works. So as we discussed with immune bio, it looks like a cocktail of drugs is probably going to be what we end up with. But why don't we start with your background, how you got involved in all of this, because I just just explained where my involvement comes from. Well, you know, I think that for so many of us, and thank you for sharing that, for so many of us, it's personal. It's it's really personal. I actually, my uh, my journey started with my grandmother who had a long battle with, with Alzheimer's um, and she was a role model of mine. And um, I actually started a, a company called Connected Living that focused on connecting and aging population before COVID, before anyone else thought that was a, a good idea, but uh, also personally along the way, um, about 10 years ago, my husband was diagnosed with um, what they thought at the time was early onset Alzheimer's, and this is part of how challenging diagnosis is. And uh, sadly, we lost him almost a year ago um, to the disease and found out that he had frontal temporal dementia and Lewy body. So this gets into, you know, yes, it's very personal. I've worked in the industry for 20 years. I've worked with hundreds and thousands of families who are in the same situation, trying to connect uh, families with their loved ones. I have personally faced it with the love of my life and uh, my kids who are only 21 and 22. And to say that this is misunderstood, that we are far behind, that there is much to do, is an understatement and it really does affect everybody. I mean, we know the numbers, right? Uh, you and everyone else you talk to, there's over 55 million people worldwide who dementia, Alzheimer's affects, but we know that as a wildly underrepresented number, my husband wouldn't have been in the represented number because the people who feel like there isn't anything we can do about it don't necessarily go and get diagnosed. However large the numbers, which are extraordinary, this probably is the largest pandemic we face in the world right now, the costs, um, both personal and financial and to our health systems, but it's going to double with an aging population to over 150 million in, in the near term. So we need a solution and we need solutions. And to your earlier point of this is a moment, th this is a moment of hope. I mean, I, we are celebrating cheering on and encouraging every bit of science because there's been almost silence for a hundred years with nothing. And now we have a moment where there's pieces here and pieces there and the science is different. And um, it's exciting because I do feel like this is a moment of hope and it's a moment where the world, maybe because of COVID, maybe for a really million reasons that a, a light was shone on brain health, mental health, our aging population, isolation, all the things we deal with. And I think people are really, really focused on a fix. And so, yes, BioV is a very exciting piece of that. Well, I'm hopeful and I will be 57 in November. So I 
my audience also knows that my paternal grandmother lived with her mind intact to 103. So that is my goal. So that will give you 46 more years, give or take a couple months to put up with me. So yeah, I'm very invested in, you know, let's find solutions, let's find treatments, let's find preventions. You know, I was out in the 90 plus degree garage doing my workout yesterday. Not fun, but I know how important it is. <laughs> So yeah, well, I'm very you're, you're right on it. I mean, this is, you know, let's talk about that because first let's talk about maybe a little bit about epigenetics and what okay. we can control, and then let's talk about bio V. Um, so what you just said is critical. What we do every day, and this is what people have to hear. This is part of the hopefulness. About 70% of our outcome is what we do every day with our lives. It is what we eat. It is how we exercise. It is our sleep. It's called epigenetics and it is the changes over time. It's our stress level. It, there are clear things we can do. More of our outcome is determined by what we do every day and our children do. This isn't an older person's issue. This is as we live birth to death, how we care for our body and brain health and the pillars of it from socialization to eating properly, to sleep, to stress, to exercise and all these things makes an enormous difference. Now to the piece that is controlled by our genes and the science and not all of us get the same hand dealt to us. Um, you know, they're the, obviously the science of figuring out what we do when we have a disease and the dementias, there are many of them. So people tend to say Alzheimer's, but the, the dementias are varied and different. And just like with cancer and other, um, you know, illnesses, we need different treatments based on what we have. So what's happening at BioV? Um, number one, I will say, again, we celebrate all the advances that have already happened. And, and again, they're, they're different and we're um, excited for everyone in the path. We have something really unique and, um, and very special. We believe that um, neuroinflammation is at the heart of the biology of Alzheimer's um, and of dementia and Parkinson's and, you know, inflammation, just like any other part of our body and our brain is not a good thing. <laughs> and um, so our molecule, NE3107, specifically focuses on reducing brain inflammation and it appears to improve cognition and memory and function. Um, this still, the results from our stage two trials, which are on our BioV Inc. website are really quite exciting. This needs to be repeated and confirmed in our phase three studies, which we're very hopeful about, but this is science. So we are going through all, all of the processes and those readouts from those new trials will be by year end. So we have a fully um, enrolled uh, stage three Alzheimer's trial and we will have other trials starting both in uh, Alzheimer's um, and mild cognitive and Parkinson's um, uh, coming, you know, coming soon. How many um, clinical trials are common for when you're searching for a treatment or a cure? Just that's, that's my curiosity going there. Well, there's a there's a whole process, and it's really really important that obviously, as you're as you're working on the science and a new a new molecule, that it goes through all of the um, safety you know procedures and processes, and so um, you have to get fully through uh, phase three uh, trials, and then there's a whole process to um, to continue to get you know uh, a molecule or drug to to market. Uh, but, you know, we we do believe both in the um, the power of the science, the importance of the trials, the willingness of the FDA and others to uh, all of us are working on solutions. We saw what could happen when the world came together to solve COVID because it was a world crisis and people collaborated and came together and we got some incredible science. And this is the kind of thing, you know, BioV is one player, but we are part of um, really trying to build consortia, collaboration, um, and, and make sure that as a community, we come out with solutions. You know, the rising tide lifts all ships. Um, we are part of um, a nonprofit organization called Social Impact Partners that is trying to bring collaboration awareness, increased funding and innovation 
to Alzheimer's and to brain health and healthy aging. So as a player in the community who has a a piece of the puzzle that we hope and think is very important and uniquely focused on neuroinflammation, which we believe to be one of the most critical things to uh, to solve. We are also uh, very much trying to be a part of both the overall community as well as encouraging innovation and healthy living um, on the uh, on the other side of the ledger. So that social impact partners, if people want more information, um, is wonderful to get involved with which will also be linked in the show notes. So what do we know that causes neuroinflammation and why is it so bad? I mean, when I think neuroinflammation, I think of a migraine. I don't know if those are connected, but (laughs) that's where my my brain goes. Well, you know, I think, um, listen, there's there's much more uh, that we don't know than what we know. And remember, in in this interview and hopefully you're speaking to uh, you're speaking to someone who who speaks like the rest of the world because i'm not the scientist i'm not the doctor i am a mother wife ceo who has spent her career trying to solve uh, a a real problem so i've read every book i serve on the boards i'm not i'm not the medical side of the equation Um, but what we do know uh, is that how we live Uh, There's a lot of science around what we do and how we live and the pillars of brain health that involve, they're sort of the obvious, right? It's your environment. It is, it is what you put in your body. It is what you eat. It is your amount of sleep. You know, you have to have a certain uh, sleep deprivation deprives the brain. Um, it, It is your exercise your peacefulness and meditation. Um, There's much research around your sense of community and purpose. So the things that would make um, a rich and healthy life, you know, I I like to sort of say that healthy living equals healthy aging equals brain health. You can't, the brain is not separated from the rest of the body. My heart's probably a lot healthier if I'm doing all those things too, right? We're all one. But this is back to that study of epigenetics, which is which is, which is so hopeful to people because it is stunning how much control we do have and the places in the world, like uh, friends we have, the you know the, all the Blue Zones research, the places in the world where people live the longest, these are things they have in common. Um, and while we're working on the science of what we don't know and rooting all of our other pharma friends on so that together we can better diagnose, we can earlier diagnose, we can differentiate and not just call everything one word, because we know that somebody has Lewy bodies, somebody has frontal temporal, somebody has Alzheimer's, somebody has Lou Gehrig, somebody has Parkinson's, you know, Um, and that we can have the right combination of science to to help them. And I think that, you know, we we do believe that because of uh, the importance of decreasing inflammation um, in the brain and its impact that actually our molecule is going to have and is having an impact on on all of these different um, dimensions. But we are we're working hard on it. We are early stage, uh, very, very hopeful results and uh, really looking forward to the readout, which uh, we certainly can can get to you and others as soon as we have it on our stage three trials, which will be by the end of this year. So do you know how they came across this molecule? Were they looking for it? Was it like one of those scientific, quote, accidents that they were looking for one thing and found another? Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. 
I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Uh, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. Um, we have two uh, brilliant scientists, uh, Chris and Clarence, on our team who've been working with this molecule for over over fifteen years. And uh, early on, it was um, it we were, they were looking at it in relation to diabetes. You know, sometimes you you um, you conduct the science, you see what the impact is, and then you realize where you might have uh, the biggest impact. And like like most good ideas or most things that come to fruition, it's the um, the stubbornness and the innovation and the willingness of people who are on the front line of innovation uh, trying to uh, trying to bring something new new to life. And this is also why the one other thing I will say to your listeners, you know, we're all in this together. We're all part of the solution. All I can see is my kids. I now have a you know, a 21 and 22 year old without a father and, um, and their grandfather had it and his older brother, uh, has dementia. And we, you know, this is very real. And, um, I think all of us need to be a part of the solution. And we also have to see that as we are working on the science, we have to see our kids, we have to see the next generations, you know, sometimes when you're solving something, it isn't even for yourself. <laughs> Um, it, it, it's for what comes next. And so the ability for people to be part of clinical trials, it can be very hard to recruit for trials, but we can't collectively solve any of these diseases um, unless people are willing to, to, to be part of the solution um, when they know they're in the, in the path or they qualify. And so one of my calls to action would be to really ask people to, if you have a chance to participate, whether it's BioV or anyone else's trial that you qualify for, I would highly encourage it because that actually is an issue is, is, is recruitment. And that's one of the most important pieces of the science is to get the trials filled and to, uh, and then to have the, the science and the data to do something about it. I also would really, really encourage people to get more information. I think a great place to go is our social impact partners um, uh, group because uh, in terms of learning more about brain health, in terms of getting involved, in terms of awareness, um, in terms of, you know, talking to working with companies. So this is for profits, nonprofits, you know, really treating employees in a certain way where it encourages brain health and healthy aging. You know, it's what it is what we do every day. And so each one of us can take a fairly profound action to decrease this extraordinary tsunami of dementia that is coming based on how we have lived the science we haven't had and the, and the global aging of a population. It is, um, it, it is probably the largest health and socioeconomic issue of our times. And for those who are entrepreneurial in nature and don't just want to solve a problem, it's probably also one of the largest, um, opportunities to, um, to help the world and serve what is a, you know, a growing silver economy. So I'm, I'm very, um, I'm very hopeful and, you know, really, really proud to be part of both the BioV team and engaged in uh, in social impact partners. Well, I'm going to ask you a little bit more about them in a second, but I have stated for quite a while that until big corporations in this country and probably globally realize that this tsunami of dementias is already affecting their bottom line, that not enough is going to change. So hmm. it sounds like Social Impact Partners is kind of directly addressing that. So can you tell me a little bit more about what Social Impact Partners is doing and the goals? Because that sounds like something I need to get involved in because not having my mom, I can't share on Instagram like, oh, here's our caregiving challenge. Like I could just talk about it in the past, which doesn't particularly resonate too well. Um, I'm more, I would like to... Being an entrepreneur and an artist, I would really like to kick some corporations in the rump and say, hey, pay attention. <laughs> this is a problem there's, already. <laughs> there's all kinds of ways to be involved. And so a few things that 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 we are doing. One, it is a consortia of business people, nonprofits, for profits, um, you know, the medical community. Uh, it, it is a place where leaders from all over the world, it's not just US, can come together and say, 
we really need to collaborate and communicate on, on what we can do for solutions. One thing that we're doing right now, which is really exciting, and there'll be a white paper coming out in September, is we have some innovation Olympics going on with business school teams from literally all over the world working on brain health and healthy aging solutions. Um, we are going to be raising capital to invest in innovation and in these solutions. We have a, a global business plan contest. We're very much encouraging a younger generation to get into the mix and help us. I think in healthcare, we have um, in many ways uh, scared, uh, scared people away, and we want people to know that this is a space of innovation, of hope, and of real opportunity. Uh, we really have a chance to raise awareness. We have um, brain health uh, series uh, that is really exciting. Um, we have had uh, several sessions already, and so I look forward to sharing those, and we can certainly get the word out on, we have them uh, every month. And um, there's going to be lots of opportunities for people to collaborate, raise awareness, uh, increase the funding and the solutions for for this disease. And, and also not just for diseases, but for brain healthy living and aging. Yeah, we don't want to, and, and this is happening now where we have um, like a, a loss of institutional um, knowledge because people retire and they've not somebody to replace them. People have to retire early to care for a spouse or they themselves have to retire or because they've got a problem. It's like I said, it's already affecting bottom lines. And then there's the sandwich generation caregivers who are taking care of children and a parent. I don't even know how they juggle all that. I had to deal with my mom when my daughter was in college. So I was not quite sandwiched, but close enough. And one of the th one thing that I think bigger companies should do is just have on-site care facility where they combine adults and children because the benefits of the two of those together actually truly benefits the per the person and the caregiver in the middle. So the children <laughs> get some free grandparent time. The older adults get time with children, which kind of gives them a little bit of purpose, a little some joy. And then, like I said, the working caregiver benefits from the positive interactions of those other two generations. So that's one solution. So yeah, I'm really no, interested. Go ahead. Fantastic one. I mean, this is, you know, workforce is absolutely being affected. There's over, there's more than 16 million Americans providing unpaid care for individuals with Alzheimer's right now. Um, you know, this is of those 16 million, <laughs> Many are working. People, call, whether you're calling in sick, whether you have to take huge, you know, time off, whether you, what you do to navigate the situation which every family is facing, and so clearly the ability um, for us as a nation and for the world to focus on how we not only support and solve those with the disease, but how we support the caregivers. You know, in many in many circumstances, the caregivers are getting sicker and even dying sooner than the people they're caring for. This is a very, um, a very stressful, very sad disease and often a very long goodbye. And the and support that those caregivers and family members need. Um, often it is an older spouse trying to deal with this. I am in a unique situation that we were younger and he was younger and I have kids and that's a sad enough battle alone. And so many, so many and many more are dealing with it with a, an elderly spouse who the capability of, of, of doing all that's needed is, is very, very difficult. And then of course the family members are, 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 are all involved. So it is, um, it is something that as a, you know, a society and uh, we, we really need to, we really need to get control of and the costs, you know, just the, it's estimated globally um, that the costs are upwards of 6 trillion. You know, this is not a, this is a major, major, major issue. And so I really like, like any issue, there's also, there is such hope because I, you know, you see these moments in time come and, I've se I'm seeing it right now. The world, for a series of reasons, and I believe the isolation caused by COVID, it's not just us focusing on the brain health of our elderly, but the brain health of our younger generation. We have a mental health crisis. We've had an isolation crisis. We've had a health crisis. And a light was shone on the fact that, yes, grandmom and granddad are alone. Well, you know what? They might have even been alone before the pandemic, but people may not have been paying as much of attention. And all of a sudden, 
you know, there really was a bright light because you couldn't see them. I mean, it was, it was a true crisis. And so I think out of every, you know, major problem, there does come an opportunity. And I think we see it. I think there is a world right now focused on, on the, on the problem we have in front of us and on solving it. So I, for one, I'm extremely hopeful. I'm extremely proud of all of the other uh, groups within the industry who are working on things. And I'm, I'm really, really thrilled to be part of, of BioV and part of a, you know, a small innovative team that I hope has a very promising piece of the, of the puzzle. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> well, I fully agree with you that a light was shown on this problem for whatever reason, I think your reasoning is pretty accurate. Back in 2017, um, my husband and I are Rotarians. We were at the International Conference. As you know, conferences always have breakout meetings, sessions. And I went to one titled Brain Health and Peace. And I thought, those don't seem to go well together. Essentially, the gist of the conversation was, we have a brain health problem. So this was how many years ago? six. I'm not so good at math. It's the one thing I should probably work on to keep my brain strong. We have a brain health issue in this in the world, the globe, and their th theory, and they're not wrong, was if we can't, they were talking about the costs and how the costs to governments can cause disables, disabilization. It's too early. It's, it's a Monday. It's too early in the week for big words. How it can cause destabilization on the globe their thought was if we can figure out a way of slowing down, um, you know, a neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's or FTD, the money, you know, if you can postpone having major symptoms of Alzheimer's 10 years, then you might die of old age first. So I kind of, now I'm seeing a lot more research and hope, which brings me back to how exactly, and I know you're not the chief science officer, so... You can speak in my language at this point. How does this uh, molecule affect the inflammation? Does it reverse it? And does the by and what is the science telling them with this molecule? Is this a treatment? I'm assuming it's not a cure. I don't think we're quite that lucky yet. So I'm I'm going to have to say stay tuned because okay. <laughs> we really are early enough that we have very promising uh, results in our stage two that are are very exciting and that we're proving out in a in a stage three with all of the all of the um connections and the data and the science that 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 we are working on but uh all of the basics of what we're doing actually do seem do seem obvious to even to the layperson, right? That if you can control inflammation and and you can, you know, impact that in a positive way, you're going to impact your health, your outcomes. Um, and again, the cognition, the motor control, the um, the health of what we are seeing from the outcomes of the early phase two are are very exciting, but um, stay tuned. <laughs> that sounds like it'll be another episode somewhere down the down the line in the future. So as a lay person working with these scientists, is it in your opinion that maybe, because I've, I've said this a lot, like I don't think modern life is very good for our brains. We, we've got terrible food, pollution, stress, people don't sleep well. There's probably a humongous list of negatives that tie in with um, modern life, like shortened attention spans, because we're like scrolling through one minute videos on YouTube. <clears throat> Something I have to stop doing. Is, do they kind of think that's one of our problems? And we, that's why we need to go back to the, you know, getting better sleep, getting more exercise. You know, my, I got an Apple watch, it's going to harass me to stand up soon. Is it are, are, is, are you as a lay Go ahead. <laughs> oh no, it, it it but these are all the right questions. And actually there are bodies and bodies of science right now. The fancy term for it is epigenetics, but it is that what we do every day is actually changes, it changes our outcome, it changes our aging process, it changes what happens to our genes, it 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 it, it changes things. And so what we um what we what we do and i and if i had even known some of the things i know today i wouldn't have done some of the things you know i did in college where you have you know multiple nights where you don't sleep because when you know what it's actually doing to you impact how it impacts you permanently you make different choices so that's where some of the awareness 
around these things that are obviously good for you, right? To get more sleep, to take a moment to stop and breathe and meditate and have less stress, to put good things in your body, um, you know, more vegetables, less preservatives, healthy foods, Mediterranean, you know, the, the, the things that, um, the things that, you know, unfortunately, when you look at health equity are sometimes harder to access for different populations. And so there's a real issue with a higher preponderance of these diseases in areas of poverty. It's, it's, it's a real problem where you can't access all of those things, right? Mm -hmm. Um, it is environmental, the air we breathe, what we drink, you know, so, um, our exercise profoundly important, um, to our outcomes. So these are, these are some of the things that we know are important and, and our socialization and our purpose. We are social creatures. Um, the, the places in the world and the people who have vibrant social networks, who are um, learning new things, languages, music, you know, who are staying, staying active, the use it or lose it um, is actually a real, a real piece of even the, the blue zones research of the, of the, of the nine elements for the people who live longest in the world. So all of these things uh, really do play in and it's, and they're kind of fun because actually the, the list is a good list. You know, it's, it's, it's a list that, that makes a healthy life and hopefully a full life anyway. So I don't think there's a burden to, um, to paying attention. It's actually quite, it's actually quite fun. <laughs> so I have a story that many of my listeners know, but I'll tell it to you anyway. So back in 2006, I'm a retired portrait photographer. and One of my clients at the time was a doctor. My dad's side of the family has diabetes run amok, basically, but interestingly, only affecting men. And she looked at me, um, I'm five foot two, and I used to weigh over 250 pounds. And she said, you have a family history of diabetes. You're overweight. You're screwed. <laughs> Perfect term to use because that just fired me up. And I'm like, that's it. I am going, if, if it takes me the rest of my life, I am going to figure out what it is I need to change in my life so I can lose the weight and keep it off. And I kept off most of it. You know, I got, I hit menopause and caregiving all at the same time. Not a great combination. Um, still working on it. But even this morning, I was just like kind of dragging. And it's like, it just blows my mind that I am not like fully ready for the day until I've done a workout. And, you know, 15 years ago, I would have laughed at you if you had said that I would be telling people that in 2023. There's a lot of things I'd be laughing at, like, you know, COVID and lockdowns and all that stuff. Nobody predicted any of that. But we it's have just to set aside to take care of ourselves. And when you do, um, it, it, it matters. It makes a difference. You, you will live longer, you will feel better. And we do give ourselves a uh, Again, that that number of, you know, somewhere between it, it can be debated, right? 65 and up to 80 of we control our outcome by what we do and how we live. And the others, there obviously is science to our bodies. We're, we're all dealt different hands, but uh, we have far more control than not. And in the in the numbers of how they add up. And so let's work on both. Let's work on the science and let's set aside the time ourselves to uh, to lead healthy lives, to run companies and organizations that honor the the family and health and the ability to take care of yourself. Those are going to be healthier workers. Um, and true. that honor because we, we have parents, we have kids, we have ourselves. And, um, and we, I think this is the, there is a, there is a world out there right now that is very cognizant that workspaces are changing, uh, that taking care of ourselves does need to be a priority. And, um, and that it will make a difference. So I really thank you for focusing on this topic. It's a big one. I agree. And as I said, you know, three generations behind me with some sort of brain disease. My, my maternal grandmother had an aneurysm that leaked for three months. So I'm pretty certain that's what caused the vascular dementia. But, you know, not always the healthiest lifestyle. My grandfather did not consider a meal complete until they had dessert. Don't know if that included breakfast, but it definitely included lunch and dinner. So that's that's a genetic inherited trait that I have had to battle firmly, <laughs> daily. It's not fun, the sugar addiction. But fortunately, some of the other bad substances have never been part of my life. So is there any last thing you want to tell us about BioV before I let you go and inform other great people in the world what's going on? 
Well, I just, I, again, I, I want to thank you for focusing on this topic. And I, you know, I just want to say I'm, I'm really proud to be a part of, of the solution and of the science. And I do encourage, please everyone, you know, I'm a lay person who just cares passionately about this and we all have a role to play. And so uh, support trials, uh, get awareness and take care of ourselves, but help be part of the solution. Totally agree. Thank you very much. And I look forward to that update when you told me to uh, stand by. I'll have to, I'll, I'll stand by, but I'm looking forward to the update. I am, I am too. It's very hopeful. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>